I want to welcome everyone today to our workshop, our webinar, Using Word and Excel to Analyze Qualitative Data. Today's event is sponsored by American University's Measurement and Evaluation Program. At American University, we are committed to pursuing inclusive excellence. One of our practices shared from our Indigenous and Native communities is to offer a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our meetings and events. The goal is to build our mindfulness of the historical processes in which we still participate. American University is founded on the unceded land of the Nakashtank, Anacostian, and Piscataway peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. American University also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we commit to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I would like to, my name is Beverly Peters. I am the director of American University's Measurement and Evaluation Program. It is great to have you here today. Excited that so many people are interested in qualitative methods. How awesome is that? I want to introduce you to our moderator. I'm gonna play a role behind the scenes because we've got a lot of people on today. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to our moderator, Shelley Golson Mickens. Shelly is a student in our Masters of Measurement and Evaluation program, and I have asked her to moderate us today. So let me hand it over to her. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Peters. Uh, before we get started, I would really like to know where everyone is joining us from. So if you would uh, feel comfortable, please uh, share where you're uh, joining us from. I've already seen a lot of people from all over the world. I see Uganda, Nigeria, um, oh, DC, <laughs> California, Charlottesville, wow, everywhere. <laughs> New York City, Costa Rica, Bangladesh. It's this is amazing. Wow. Well, hello. I'm I'm joining from Columbia, South Carolina. So it's nice to be connected with everybody from all over the world today. All right, well, welcome again. Thank you so much for joining our workshop. Um, our speaker today is Seth Tucker. Seth is an alum of our Project Monitoring and Evaluation Certificate Program. He's an evaluation analyst at TCC Group, where he uses qualitative and quantitative methods that incorporate machine learning, social network analyses, and natural language processing. Seth has previously coordinated as well as managed and analyzed data for evaluation projects in Latin America and the United States related to fair trade, social return on investment, property formalization, adult education, and sustainable agriculture, among others. All right, Seth, well, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you again for leading our workshop today. Thank you so much, Shelley, and thank you, Dr. Peters and American University for this opportunity uh, to share about qualitative analysis, something that I am passionate about um, and care a lot about. I also care about quantitative analysis, but I, I love qualitative analysis as well. And I'm always thrilled to be around people who are interested in the things that I also find interesting. So seeing so many people register and show up today is very exciting. In my time in, eval in evaluation, I've always been fascinated by the amount of different ways that people analyze qualitative data. Some prefer to do it by hand. Some people use qualitative analysis software like Deduce or Invivo. Some use Excel, among many different ways. Today, I will be sharing a method that has worked for me and hopefully could work for you as well. This will be a very use-oriented webinar and will involve a demonstration of a step-by-step -step process to use Word and Excel to analyze qualitative data, with the goal being that everyone can walk away with, uh, from this webinar with a new tool in their qualitative analysis toolbox. And don't worry, I'm going to be sharing a lot of information. Don't worry if you don't absorb it all or remember it all, all the documents that are shared today will also be shared, um, will be public, and the re this will be recorded so you can watch later. So don't worry about remembering everything that I talk about today. Um, you can 
review this later as well. Before doing that demonstration of the qualitative analysis, I will provide a little bit of background on how I came to start using this method and some important definitions that will be used in the webinar. As stated earlier, please feel free to write questions and we will try to answer as many as we can um, through the presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, as I said, I'm gonna first talk about a little bit of background in terms of how I started using this method and um, yeah, how it came to be. So a few years ago, I was in, um, on a project to understand motivations and incentives for Colombian farmers to implement sustainable agriculture practices and receive sustainability certificates. It was a mixed method project, and we had a lot of semi-structured inter interviews with a bunch of different stakeholders. We were a team of four, and we would all be conducting interviews with various stakeholders and analyzing that qualitative data. Everyone on the team had different levels of experience in qualitative analysis and different levels of experience with qualitative analysis tools like deduce or in vivo. So we had a plan for our qualitative data collection and analysis. And this plan was similar to many plans that people create when they're doing qualitative analysis. So the first thing we wanted to do was identify our key stakeholders. And we did that through various ways, through talking to um, you know, our contacts in the community and understanding who would be the most important people to involve in these semi-structured interviews that we were going to do. We then created our semi-structured interview questions. These questions were based on a methodology that we were using for our project. So we created those cross questions. Then we scheduled those interviews. We implemented the interviews. After collecting all that data and transcribing that data, we arranged the data, coded the data, which involves reading through all the data and assigning different codes or descriptions to all that qualitative data that we had. We then began identifying themes and then presenting findings. So in this process, the steps that have a star by it, so arranging the data, coding the data, and identifying themes, it was very important that everybody on our team was on the same page that we were all doing it in the same way. Because there was a team of four and we were all going to be arranging, coding the data and identifying themes, we all had to do it in the same way. Because if one person was doing it with NVivo, another person was doing it with Excel, another person was doing it by hand, whatever it may be, it would be very difficult in the end to be able to analyze that data and really take out meaningful themes and findings. And so it was important that we were all on the same page and able to do it together. And this was difficult because as I stated earlier, we all had different levels of qualitative analysis experience and different levels of experience with different software that we could use. So we had to find a way that worked for everybody. So what I've found with any project that I've been on is these three things are very important to have. And I will talk a little bit about what I mean by, by these three things. So I have standardization of definitions, standardization of tools, and standardization of process. What I mean by standardization is that everybody has a common understanding of what it is that we're talking about. I've been on many teams where people come into evaluation or qualitative analysis from many different backgrounds and people talk about it in different ways. And so they might have different, different um, definitions. They might have different words that they're using. And so this first one, standardization of definitions is making sure that everybody's talking about qualitative analysis in the same way. That when I say content analysis or I say coding or I say, 
whatever I say about qualitative analysis, that the other people on my team interpret it in the same way that I interpret it, that we have this common set of definitions that we're using in our analysis, and we all think about it the same way so that we approach it in the same way. When I say standardization of tools, I mean what I was talking about earlier. It's that we're using the same tool to analyze the data. Now, many times on many teams, people have preferences for what tools they want to use. And that's fine many, many times. You know, maybe somebody wants to use in vivo, other people want to use Excel, whatever it may be. But if we're all looking at the same data, if we're all collecting data and then all analyzing that data, it is important that we're using the same tools because if we're all using different tools when analyzing the same data, again, the analysis gets very messy and it can be very difficult in the end to take out the most important findings. So, and the last one is standardization of process. And that means, okay, so we have, we're all using the same definitions. We're all talking about analysis in the same way. We're all using the same tools, but are we using the same process, right? So if we're using Excel, that doesn't mean we're all gonna be analyzing data in the same way in Excel. Someone might be you know, doing it in their head and just adding a new column and putting what's in their head um, in some way in a new column. Another person might be doing it in a different way. So the idea is to then use these tools and definitions and make sure everybody is using also the same process and analysis. Once these three things have been checked off, I have found that the analysis process goes much smoother. If any one of these is not checked off, then down the line, it, you know, it might be more difficult to really get the analysis that you want. So the first one there is definitions. Certain definitions we can talk about as a team. We have our type of analysis, we have our coding type, we have our coding method, and we have our coding structure. I'm gonna talk a little bit about these, but I'm not gonna to get too in depth about the analysis type, method, and structure. What I will show is the that what I do want to point out is there are different types of analysis. There are different coding types. There are different coding methods and there are different coding structures. And it's important to consider them all before doing the analysis. A lot of times when we're doing our analysis, we default to that which is the easiest or we default to that which we are most comfortable with. And it's important to not do that. It's important to understand that really the, the objectives of the analysis and what outcomes we're looking to really understand should guide what type of analysis we are doing. So what I, and I'm gonna show something a bit later that goes more in depth about the definitions of these different things. So I'm not gonna talk too much about definitions right now, but I will a bit later. But I do want to show this just so that we understand that there are different types of analysis, coding, and coding methods that we can use. And so when I'm starting analysis, what I like to do with the team is that we sit down and we look at a list, right? We look at a list of the different types of analysis that we could do. And then we decide as a team, what is the best type of analysis for this project? We don't do the same analysis for every project we consider our options and then choose that which we feel is, is best achieves the objective that we want. Same with coding type. We have deductive, inductive, and hybrid coding, which I'll talk about in a second. And we have to understand and consider which is the best type of coding that we wanna do for this project. The same with method. I will talk about these definitions in a moment. But we have you know, descriptive or in vivo coding or process coding or structural coding or value coding. Again, we sit down as a team, consider the options, and pick that which we all feel achieves uh, the outcomes in the best way. So the idea here is don't always default to that which you're most comfortable with. Ask what does the analysis require? And I will show in a moment kind of a template that I have um, that I use with, with my teams where we consider these different options and, and look at the different definitions of, of these. But once we've chosen it, so for example, here we say, okay, we will do a content analysis 
with hybrid coding that will use descriptive and structural coding. Okay, so let's call that out. Let's make that very clear with the team what we're doing. So we're going to do a content analysis where we're going to categorize the interview data to classify and summarize this data. We will use hybrid coding. So when we're coding that data, we will have a set of established codes, deductive, and then we'll add new codes as well, inductive, while we're working through the data. So these established codes, these deductive codes, will be structural coding that uses who, what, where, when, and how to, to guide the description, the descriptive coding. So when we're looking through the data, we're going to say, okay, they're talking about a who here. They're talking about a where. They're talking about a what, a when, or a how. And then we're going to use descriptive coding. And that's where we'll use, um, we'll add new codes that summarizes ideas by using a single word or a phrase that encapsulates the general idea of the data. So we'll use the structural and descriptive coding to help us go through and analyze our data. So once that's been called out and made explicit, so everybody's on the same page, then we can go to um, our tools. And so, to remind everybody, we did not have, in this specific instance, when we started using this method in Excel and Word, we did not have access to uh, analysis software. So we did not have deduce or in vivo or anything else. Also, the organization we were at did not have the funds to purchase any software. So we did, didn't have access to the software even if we wanted it. Also, some team members did not have time and or desire to learn the software. This is especially important too when many times in analysis, uh, we don't have much time. We have very short uh, schedules to accomplish everything. And so we don't have time for all the team members to learn new software. Um, so that wasn't really, and in this project especially, we did not have a lot of time. So we didn't have time to do that. So we had to think, what were the tools that we all have and we all know how to use? Well, we all had Microsoft Word and Excel. And that's something that hopefully many of you in, in this session also have. It's, it's a very common program to have on, on your computer. It's much more common than having deduce or in vivo. So we all had Microsoft Word and Excel. OK, great. Let's go with that. So we have our definitions. We have our tools. Now we need to talk about process. So that's when we talk about, OK, we have Word and Excel. We know that. But how are we going to use it together to be able to robustly and efficiently code and analyze the data? So that's the next step that we're going to go to, where I'm going to go through the step-by-step -step process of how we can use Word and Excel to analyze and code data. Before we get to that, though, I do want to stop and see if there's any questions about just the background and anything that I've talked about so far before I move on to the step-by-step -step process of coding in Word and Excel. It looks like you've answered the question already about content um, analysis, narrative analyses, and discourse. So if there aren't any other questions, I think you can proceed. Okay, that's great to hear. All right. Um, so now we're going to get into the fun stuff, I think. Um, and this is going to get, again, very in the weeds and very detailed in some certain parts. So please don't worry if you don't absorb all the information. This document will be available after the webinar, as, as is the recording. So I'm going to start throwing a lot of information about the process of using Word and Excel to analyze this data. So the first thing is we need Word and Excel, OK? Uh, Microsoft Word and Excel um, are programs that, that you know, they're for, for fee, so we usually have to pay for them. But, um, but we need to start off with, with having those programs to be able to use this method. So once we want to start analyzing data in Microsoft Word, the first thing we have to do before I even talk about anything else is disabling something called modern comments. Um, 
don't ask me too much about what modern comments are or what their purpose is. I just know they don't really work very well when we're trying to analyze data in Word. So the first thing that I do is disable modern comments. And so we open up a new Word document. We go to File. We go down here to where it says Options. And there's this little checkbox here that says Enable Modern Comments. Many times that will be on when you open up a new document. You just have to turn it off. That's all we got to do. So just get rid of Enable Modern Documents and we say OK. So that's the first thing we have to do before we start analyzing data. Again, I'm not an expert on modern comments. I don't know quite what the purpose of them are, but I know that they don't work very well <laughs> with this method. So just get rid of them. OK. So now that we got that out of the way, we want to arrange our data. So we have to organize our data in a way that makes it easy and efficient for analysis. A way that I enjoy doing it, but it definitely doesn't have to be this way, is arranging your data by question. So we have our question, and then below each question, we have the responses from the different respondents. Um, if you want to organize the data in a different way, no problem. You can arrange it by respondent and then by each respondent's answer to the question. That's fine too. So here, for example, I have my first question. Do you feel the benefits resulting from sustainable certification justify the financial investment needed to meet the requirements? Why or why not? And then I have respondent one, what respondent one said. Here, I have what respondent two said. Here, I have what respondent three said. So this is a way we can organize our data. But again, we can organize it by respondent as well. So you can say respondent one, and then below that, question one, question two, question three. That's another way to do it as well. I want to talk really quickly about transcribing data. So when we're interviewing or having focus groups or whatever kind of qualitative data we have, we needed to get it into text somehow, because in text is where we can really start analyzing it. Um, and that's always very difficult to do, especially when we want a low cost or free option. So I do want to just point out really quickly that we can transcribe in Google Docs. Um, there are many transcription software that sometimes cost money or have a limit to how much words or time you can you can have transcribed. And so kind of keeping in the theme of having low cost accessible options, I just do want to point this out that if we go, if we just open a Google Doc and Google Docs are free if, with a Google account, you just open a Google account and um, you can get a Google Doc open. And we just go to voice typing. You go to tools and then voice typing and then click the microphone. You can play the record the audio that you have from the semi-structured interview or from the focus group and Google will transcribe that into Google Docs. It won't be perfect and you can see as it's transcribing what I say right now it might not be perfect but you can definitely go through afterwards and make any corrections that you need. So this is a free tool that can be used to transcribe any audio that you have collected from any kind of qualitative analysis. So I want to point this out because that's a big trick, right? You have all this audio, you have all this qualitative data. How do you get it into text? And this is a way that you could do it. So I will get out of here. And again, there are other ways to do it as well, but that's a free option that, that can be used. Actually, I hope that, did everyone see that? I hope that everyone saw, yeah, okay. I don't think I was sharing that. I'm gonna share that one more time, the Google one. Um, I was trying, sorry about that. I think I was trying to switch screens and it didn't actually show. So if you go to a Google doc like this and you go to tools and you go to voice typing, a microphone will pop up here. And you just click the microphone and Google will start transcribing the audio that you have. And so if you have audio from a qualitative analysis, from an interview, you it, Google will transcribe it right here. So sorry, I don't think that presented the first time, but this is how you do it. And uh, it's a free option to use. 
Okay, I'm gonna go back into the document. All right, perfect. I see it. Understood it clearly now. Perfect. Okay, we're gonna go back to the document. Um, so once we have our transcription, we need to create our coding structure. So when we talked about our coding before, we you know we were talking about our content analysis. We're going to use inductive coding, deductive coding, but we need to create a hierarchy of codes now. Because when we start reading through our analysis, we need to start assigning these codes to the different, uh, to the text, really. And so we need a hierarchy. And so I'm going to show you an example hierarchy of what we used in the project that I was talking about, where we had these semi-structured interviews um, with farmers in, uh, in regards to sustainable farming. So our hierarchy was first respondent. So we had we put down the name of the survey respondent. The second code was the question number. So that was the question being answered. That was just question one, question two, question three, whatever it may be. The next one was our structure code. So that was what, when, how, who, where, why, or a noteworthy example. So what were they talking about? Were they talking about uh, why something was happening, where something was happening, who, uh, how, whatever? they were talking about, we assigned it to that structure code. Then we use a descriptive code, which was a single word or phrase that encapsulated the general idea of what was being said. And then we just copied and pasted the exact text, quote, or response that we were referring to. And that was our last code. You can choose whatever coding structure makes the most sense for any analysis. You know, and here maybe it would have made more sense to have the descriptive code before the structure code or the question before the respondents. Whatever makes more sense, most sense for the analysis is fine. But this is what made sense for our team. So we went with this hierarchy. So I'm going to show you now what that looks like to use that hierarchy of coding in a Word document. So now we have to code our data. In qualitative analysis, Coding data is a very critical part of really being able to take out findings and understand what is being said about, about a question. So we read through the data. And as you are reading, you leave comments using the defined coding structure and separating each code by a semicolon. So let's unpack that a little bit and talk through it. To leave a comment in Word, we highlight a text and select new comment. So for example, if I want to leave a comment here, I just highlight the text and it even pops up sometimes, but you can right click and say new comments. And then over here, I can write a new comment. So that's how we can leave a comment in Word. So with these comments, we're going to start using our coding hierarchy. So for example, if our coding structure was this, right, like up here, this coding structure, it would look like this on a comment. So we would put our question number, semicolon, respondent number, semicolon, structure coding, semicolon, descriptive coding, semicolon, and then the text. So what does that look like? Well, it could look like this when it's actually coded. Q2. OK, so that's our. Question number two, okay, Q2, semicolon, R1, respond, so that's a respondent one, semicolon, what? So they're answering something that has to do with a what, semicolon, model farms. So they're talking about model farms, semicolon. And this is exactly what they said. Something hands-on. I heard that some extractors have model farms where they show producers, producers how to be more sustainable. That would be very helpful but I've never been invited to a training like that. So here they're talking about model farms. It's a what the first respondent is saying it and it has to do with question number two. Okay, so I'm gonna show more examples of this, but this is kind of how we can set up that hierarchy in comments in Word. And as you can see, every coding is separated by a semicolon. This will be very important later. So don't try and separate it by a period well, you, what, I think the most important thing is consistency. It needs to all be separated by the same thing. But I found that separating it by a semicolon 
is very useful and efficient. So don't separate it by um, different things. I would go with the semicolon. So it'll look like this when you're doing your coding. A bunch of comments will pop up over here, right? So, and as the analyst, you don't have to code every single thing in the Word document. You need to use your lens to see really what is the most important parts of a text to be coded. And what are the mo most important parts of text to answer the questions that we want to answer in our analysis? And so at the end, though, it will look like this. It'll have be a bunch of different comments. So here, Q1, R1, and what, expensive certification, you know, increased revenue, all the things that they're talking about, I'm, I'm coding, right? Anything that seems important or interesting, I'm coding over here. Q1, R2, increased sales. Et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So all these comments are, are related to the hierarchy that I was doing. So this can seem overwhelming, but I do want to say that this gets really easy and quick once you get the hang of it. Um, once once you start learning how to, you know, put the comments quickly and remember to separate everything by a semicolon and remembering the coding hierarchy, this gets really quick. And so I've, when I've presented this method sometimes, I've heard people say, this looks like too much work. Um, it looks like too much manual labor. And I, and I will say it, it really just isn't in my, in my experience. It, just, it doesn't take longer than other methods like using analysis software. It really doesn't take much longer or take much effort. It's just free and, and easier to use. And so I will say if this looks like a lot of comments and a lot of work, it, it really goes quickly once you get the hang of it. For a quick analysis, if you don't have a lot of time and you just need to analyze your data quickly, it should not take much longer than just reading through the data one time. Um, and it gets quick once you get the hang of it. If you, if you have more time or need to do a more in-depth analysis, then you, would read the data and reread it multiple times to ensure that nothing was missed. Um, so it kind of depends on how much time um, and effort you can really put into the analysis in terms of how much time you can dedicate to reading and rereading that kind of thing. Okay, so that's that. So let's pretend like we're done with our we're done coding our analysis now. We've done all the coding we need. So now what we need to do is copy all the comments. Okay, um, to copy all the comments, we select the text in the first comment. So you just select the text. And on your keyboard, you hit Control Shift End. And it'll select all the comments. As you can see, all the comments are now selected. Okay, and so to say that again, we select the text in the first comment, then press Control Shift End. And, and you can find those on, on your keyboard. Every keyboard's a little bit different. So I hesitate to tell you exactly where these are on a keyboard because it might be different on your keyboard. Um, but you might just have to search a little bit or hunt. But the idea is to push Control, Shift, and End, and it will highlight all the comments. I will say Word gets a little weird sometimes. And it doesn't like doing it. It doesn't like selecting all the comments. You might have to do a little bit of troubleshooting. But I will give a tip. If pressing Control Shift End does not select all the comments, try putting an additional comment on a later page, like I've done here, just any random comment. So I have all my coding done up here. And say for whatever reason, when I try doing Control Shift End, it doesn't select all of them. It doesn't do that. Try going to some random page later, putting some random comment here, and try control shift end again. And that might solve the problem. Um, hopefully that will solve the problem. But I found sometimes that it gets a little weird and I have to play around with it before, before it selects all the comments, but it should select all the comments. Um, so once we select all the comments, then we have to copy all the comments. So I'm gonna do that one more time. So I'm gonna select my first comment. I'm going to push control shift end, and then I'm going to copy. So I'm just going to hit copy. You can also do control C or hit copy here. 
So either way is fine. And now we get to move on to Excel. So we're kind of done with Word now. Um, we've done all that Word allows, you know, we need to do in Word in order to get to this process part of our analysis. So then we're going to open up an Excel document. So Excel many times comes with Microsoft Word. If you if you but if you purchase Microsoft Word, uh, Microsoft Excel comes with it. There are other also free versions of that are very similar to Excel. So if you don't have Excel, there might be a free version that you can get, um, and it works in exactly the same way. So what we want to do here is just open up a new spreadsheet, just any spreadsheet, and we want to copy our comments onto the spreadsheet. So all the comments that we highlighted and copied from the Word document, we're going to paste into the Excel document. So here we're going to right click and just hit paste. And all the codes that I have for my Word document now pop up on my Excel document. Oh, wait, I don't think I'm sharing my Excel right now. Give me one second. Okay, hopefully now we're, those were some of the questions since I can't, I can't see the Excel. Okay, hopefully now you can see the Excel. Um, can someone confirm that you can see the Excel right now? Shelly, are we seeing the yep, Excel? we can okay. see it. Perfect. So now we're gonna go into the Excel and we're gonna copy, we're gonna paste all the comments that we had. So now we have all the, com all the codes from our Word document are now in our Excel, which is pretty cool. Um, and in the Excel, is, here is where we can start doing really interesting analysis with all these different codes. So what I can do is, and this is all in the Word document too. So when I pass you the Word document, you're going to see this step-by-step -step process of, of how to do this in, in Excel. But we go into, into Excel, we highlight this first column where all the codes are. Then we go to data. And we go to text to columns. Okay, there's something called text to columns here in Excel. Depend again, depending on the version of Excel you have, this might be located in a different spot, but it should be called the same. It should be called text to columns. And with mine, it's when you go to the data tab and go to text to columns. So here I'm going to click text to columns. And this screen, this should pop up here. And you're going to see two options, fixed width or delimited. I'm going to choose delimited and go to next. And this is why it's important to separate everything by a semicolon, because here is where you can separate each code into its own column. So we can examine, you know, we can examine all answers by question or by, by um, respondent or by category or whatever you want to look at the codes by, we can do it now because they'll all be in separate columns. So here we want to separate everything by semicolon. So that's why it's important to separate each code by semicolon because here's where we're going to separate them. So make sure semicolon is um, checked off right here in this screen. Then we hit next. And we hit finish. This was just a random comment. Now you can see each code is in a different column. So I have here in this first column is my question, right? This is my question. So I, for this example, I'm only using two questions, but I have question one, question two. This next column is my respondent. Respondent. So I have respondent one, respondent two, respondent one, respondent two, respondent three. So I have my different respondents here. Here, I have my structure code. So I have my what's, my examples, my whens, my hows, all that kind of stuff. So here I have my structure code. I think I misspelled structure, structure code. And here I have my descriptive code. So I have expensive certification, faraway trainings, 
reputation, increased sales, whatever my descriptive code that I was using, I have that here. And here I have my text. So this is a, the exact text from the respondent. So I think that certifications could help us make more money. Um, example, whatever, whatever it is over here is the exact text that the respondent said. And so from here, I have my codes and all my data nicely organized so that I can start pulling out themes and start seeing what emergent themes are coming from my data. So a lot of times I like putting in a new column here that says theme. And so the theme is, is what emergent themes are coming from reading through my different codes over here. And so what I can do, for example, is put in this column. So to put in a new column in Excel, I right click and I just say insert. And now I'll put a new column here. I go to home and I want to filter. So I'm gonna filter, put a filter on here. So I go to home, sort and filter and put a filter. And now I can arrange all the different codes alphabetically. So for example, a lot, you know, maybe when you're coding, you're not using the exact same descriptive code every time a common theme comes up, but hopefully they'll be pretty similar. And so if I arrange my descriptive code alphabetically, I can start seeing certain things pop up many times. So increased market price, increased revenue, increased revenue, increased sales. These all seem related, right? These all seem like a theme that might be emerging from my data. Or far away trainings, far away trainings. You know, I, I, these, and this is only an example, but in the data collection that we did, that emerged a lot. People were saying that we don't, we can't arrive to these trainings that are being held about environmental uh, sustainable standards. And so we can't arrive to these trainings. So that's another emerging theme that's happening. And so I can start looking through and see what kind of codes are emerging and put that uh, over here. So um, maybe my theme for faraway trainings is um, lack of access to trainings, for example, something like that. And so then I can start assigning these themes to all the different codes that have to do with it. So increased revenue slash sales, something like that. That can be a theme that's emerging here. And I can start talking about that when I start presenting these findings. So now that I have the theme, I can start playing around and seeing what kind of things are emerging from my data. Um, I'm gonna go back and start uh, start writing about my findings. So certain themes that, that we just saw over there were increased sales, market prices, revenue, travel barriers, and maybe other certification benefits that farmers mentioned. So I can start looking at these themes and start presenting them in certain ways. So for example, so identify emerging narratives that come through the data. As you read through the comments and see emerging themes, you can be begin to extract summaries. For example, and I'm just gonna read this paragraph that could have been extracted from some of the data that I was looking at. Small scale farmers express mixed opinions about sustainable certification. Some saw it as a valuable investment that could bring financial benefits and improve the reputation of their farm and industry. Others had concerns about the high cost and difficulty of traveling to necessary training sessions, which are often held far away. This sentiment was summarized by one farmer who said, I tried contacting the extractor about receiving training last month, and they told me I had to go to a training they were holding that was far away and I couldn't go. They need to be more accommodating. Some farmers suggested alternative methods of learning about sustainable practices necessary to receive the certification, such as model farms or phone apps. Overall, the farmers recognized the importance of sustainable certification for the environmental benefits and increased access to the market but also expressed a need for more accessible and convenient training options. So that's some sort of summary finding that I can pull out from that data if I needed to present it in a more compact way. Um, I will just say one thing though, 
that the saturation, so a lot of times when we're looking through these codes, we're going to see what people said a lot. And we're going to use what people said a lot in order to inform what our findings are. But I just want to highlight this quote from uh, Janice Margaret Morse in, in her piece called The Significance of Saturation, where she says, richness of data is derived from detailed description, not the number of times something is stated. Frequency is central to the analysis, but is often the infrequent gem that puts other data into perspective and becomes a central key to understanding the data and for developing the model. It is the implicit that is interesting. So I just want to point out that quote too, because I feel like in qualitative analysis, we can almost become too quantitative in terms of let's just count up how many times somebody said something, and that's really how we're going to present findings. And while that's important to do sometimes, um, I do just want to point out that let's not get too lost in that. Let's also be able to find nuance in what people are saying. And maybe the quietest voice, or maybe something that isn't said a lot, is also very important. And so we don't want that to get lost when we're just counting up how many times people are saying something in our Excel sheet. We also want to remember that other people have voices that maybe might be in the minority of that voice, but they're important to express in, in findings as well. And I will leave you with just this. And again, I'm not going to go too much into it, but this will be part of this document that you can review at your leisure after this presentation. And this has all the definitions of the different types of analysis. Um, and so Again, this is the template that I use with, with my teams. Uh, we just review. We go through the different types of analysis, read the definitions, and see if this is something that can be applied to the analysis that we're using. And we kind of come up with the one that uh, is most appropriate. When we come up with the one that's most appropriate, we just put an X by it. And so, and same with coding type, we look through the different definitions, and we put the X by the one that's, that's most appropriate and the inductive and um, or hybrid coding method. Again, we look through the different possibilities and pick the one that is most appropriate. And here, just again, defining the coding structure. And this I put at the beginning of any analysis document so that anybody who reads the analysis document knows what the definitions are. Because many times as a team, we're analyzing a document, but maybe you know, your boss needs to read it, maybe a client needs to read it, maybe somebody else who's not part of that team needs to read through that analysis document to make sure it was done correctly. And so this is a way that you can define the analysis for anybody who wasn't part of the team and they can look through it and be like, okay, this was a content analysis that used hybrid coding uh, with descriptive, descriptive and structural coding and this was the coding structure. And that would allow them to understand what the analysis was. Um, and I think that's all. So that's how you can go from uh, interviewing or doing any kind of qualitative analysis to putting that up, to putting that text into Word, coding all of it, getting it into Excel, organize it, start looking for themes, start extracting themes, and being able to present that into any kind of way that you need to present it. If, and here I presented it in a way that was you know, a summary paragraph, but it can also be presented in different ways. Um, yeah, so that's all. I, we're going to have put time for questions right now. I do just want to say one more time that all of this information, I know it's a lot, will be available to you. Um, all this is just stuff I just want to share and make sure that everyone has access to this. If it works for you, that's great. And um, I also want to put my LinkedIn uh, you can look for me. My name is Seth Tucker, um, and here's the link to my LinkedIn, and I am happy to talk about this analysis process or methods or troubleshooting if I can help in any way. Um, I always love helping out, so feel free to, to contact me or connect with me on LinkedIn, and, um, and we can continue that conversation there. But, uh, but yeah, I will pass it back to Shelly, who I think maybe has some questions. Yes, thank you, Seth. So tons of questions, of course. Great, okay. great session. 
Um, some of them are technical and some of them are, are kind of context, contextual. So I'll start with the first one. There were several um, questions about kind of the um, use of Google Docs for the same features that you were using in Microsoft Word. Um, so can you speak to that? Or are there any discrepancies between the two? I wouldn't think so. Now, I do want to caveat this with um, every, every, it just seems like even when we're using Google Docs or using Word, it just seems like everybody's experiences it a little bit differently. What computer you have, what keyboard you have, there's just so many things that even though it looks like it's the same, um, it might not be. I don't see any issues with using Google Docs. The only thing that I would maybe think might be an issue is the whole selecting all the comments part. Um, that gets a little weird in Word, and so it might get a little weird in Google Docs as well, but I don't foresee any issues there. Um, and especially with Google Sheets, I think is the other. Like You can do the same process with Google Docs, and Google Sheets. So if you do not have Word and Excel, because um, those do cost money sometimes, then I would see no issue with going with Google Docs and, and Google Sheets. Go for it, have fun. If something happens that doesn't work, let me know, but I think it should work fine. Excellent, okay. Um, what about the Mac version of this process? <laughs> a lot of questions oh, on that. Great, uh, <laughs> I'm not much of a Mac user. I. I just can't, I can't tell you. I think play around with it would be my, would be my um, recommendation. I don't think it would be that much different. I mean, there's Word and Excel for Mac too. Um, I would just say play around. And again, if that doesn't work, Google, Google Docs, Google Sheets, just try that option. And that works out okay. anyway. Okay, so there were some earlier some questions about um, just the different language features when using the um, Google transcription service. So can those languages be changed? As, yes, as far as I know, they can be. Let's go in really quickly mm -hmm. um, and just see. But as far as I know, yeah, so um, so was, So what you can do, and it, you have to play around with this because I haven't used it in many different languages, but here there's a drop down menu and you can select from all these different languages here if it's in a different language. So if it's in Spanish, French, whatever it may be, you can just select the language um, that that the audio is in and that should work. Now, I don't know if it works as well as in English. I'm not quite sure, but play around with it. and. It is a function, so hopefully it works as well as, as it does in English. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question about the maximum sample size um, and a, kind of an estimate of if there's a limitation to how large of a sample you could be working with. In terms of the process, there no. I mean, the process, the only limit would be the number of rows in an Excel sheet, but those are pretty much limitless. And so I, and just to, you know, it can get bigger than this, but I've used this process for hundreds of interviews, where there's been hundreds and hundreds of interviews and it's worked out completely okay. And so I don't imagine that there would ever be a time when you would hit a limit in Word or Excel, that it would just be too much. I don't foresee that happening. Yeah. There's a couple of questions about that. I thought that was a really interesting one. But then also someone asked about like the uh, uh, the actual assessment that you're using and the number of questions. I, it's kind of similar, but I just wanted you to speak to that. Um, um, if there's a limit to the size of the actual data collection tool that you're using or anything like that. No, again, I mean, the limit would be someone's patience to use the method, I think. Um, so I, but I think I will caveat this by saying this method and process probably won't work for every kind of analysis that's, that needs to get done. For massive, massive analysis, maybe, it might make more sense to use a coding software, honestly, like in vivo or the dupes, because then those are really designed for really, really big projects. Um, and so I, I'm not there would never be an actual limit. There would just be a limit to the time when you say, is it worth using this process 
and method versus a different method that might be more efficient. Um, and so that might be the, the situation more than anything. But I don't, yeah, th there's no limit to what, what can be done with this process in terms of sample size or data that, that we were in the box in. Okay. Um, there was a question about repeating um, how you copied all of the comments in the Word document before moving it into Excel. Yeah, you absolutely. Showing us that one more time. Absolutely. <laughs> documents. Okay, I'm going to share my screen one more time. So what you do is you just highlight the first comment. So the first comment at the beginning of the document, you highlight. And then you hit, and I'll just go to the, con, well, control shift end. So I'm gonna, I don't know where I put that. Okay, here, control shift end. And so in that order too. So first push control, then push shift, and then push end. And then so if I so if I do that, I push control, then I push shift, and then I push end, it'll just automatically highlight all of the comments that are that are over here. From there, I can just go back to any comment. I just go to the first comment, right click, and um, hit copy. And so once it's copied, then I go into my Excel sheet and I paste it all into the first column. And I will say one more time, this gets, it works, but it just, sometimes you have to do this for some reason. If it's not working, just put some random comment on a later page. Um, it doesn't, it just any random comment. It doesn't need to really be anything. And, uh, and then go back to the first comment and try it again, and it hopefully it should work. Hey, all right. We still have com or questions coming through. So let me let me ask you. This was one that came up earlier as well, and it, it, there were a couple of them. It had to do with the thematic analysis um, versus content analysis. Some of the differences, um, and if there are techniques that you use based on the type of analysis that you are doing. Yeah, I mean, I would say yes. And so, if I share my screen one more time. The type of analysis that you do is going to inform how you use this method. And so the content analysis is a very basic, uh, it's it's a more straightforward way, I would say. You were just kind of like looking to categorize information. But if we're using other ones, like narrative analysis, discourse analysis, we have to do it in different ways. And it can be done in this process, but it will inform how we're doing it. Um, and so I, I just I don't want to speak, you know, specifically about any one type of type of analysis. What I will say generally is that this method can be used for any kind of analysis, but it will inform in terms of how you're coding it, right? Um, if you're talking about a narrative analysis where you're talking more about how something is being said rather than what is being said, then that's going to inform the codes that you're using. Um, it, or if you're talking about discourse analysis and analyzing in its social context, your codes might be longer and they might be, a, you know, not just kind of a word or a phrase, but you might have to talk more in depth about how language is fitting into social context. And so all of this can be done. There's no limit to how much um, text is in the comments. So you can keep writing in those comments and there's, not, there's no limit there. And so if you need to use more words in order to, uh, do the type of analysis that you're you're doing, that's fine. Um, and there should be no limit in terms of being able to do that in this process. Can you speak briefly to the visualizations that you um, that you're able to do using this uh, data? Uh, well, the visual I you know I, I hesitate, you know, Visualizations of qualitative data is a very, it's a topic that I think there's a lot of debate about. Um, what I will say is you, you can, right? You can create 
word clouds, you can create graphs. You can, you know, when I'm talking about frequencies, you can do that. Um, it's limited in terms of some of like the, well, here's what I would say. In Excel, you can do kind of those basic things. Like you can do frequencies and you can do that. If you want to do something that's a bit more in depth, you know, like I've seen things in, in Vivo where you can kind of see connections between words and connections between that kind of thing, you'd have to put it into a different program. Um, if I'm doing visualization of qualitative analysis, I use R. And so it would just be a matter of putting that Excel document and just putting it into R and then using that program to, to visualize however I wanted to. Um, but you will be limited um, by Excel to, to just do, only do the visualizations that Excel allows for. If you want to do more in-depth visualizations, you would have to put it into a different program like R or like in Vivo or Deduce or something like that. Okay. Well, there was another question I definitely want to make sure to, um, to highlight too. I'm trying to get through as many as possible. Um, but they talked about some of the um, privacy and data security using um, Google Docs and using this method. Have you had to um, contend with that? And is there a problem that you faced? That's something that I am just not going to talk about um, because every organization is different. Every kind of data is different in terms of how sensitive it is. And so that is just something that, I mean, look, it's Google. And so if it's very sensitive, I would default to saying, you know, let's not use Google <laughs> if it's if it's very sensitive information, but it is something that needs to be worked out with an organization and um, with any kind of data security team. But it, it's Google. So it's in the cloud. If, if you're, uh, yeah, if you're using Google, um, what's the question about Google Docs or Word or, sorry. This question, I'm, I'm going through all of the questions and comments to try to find a specific question, but it okay. it had to do, I believe, with Google Docs. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. If you're putting stuff in Google Docs, you know, Here we be, go. Very, yeah. be, be very cognizant about what information you're putting in there. And, um, but yeah, it's something that it's really kind of depends on the circumstance. Okay. And another question that I see that was coming up a couple of times was about stakeholder uh, communication and um, sharing the actual coding structures with stakeholders and what that looks like? I think that'd be amazing. I think the the problem with some of this stuff is it gets very wonky um, and in the weeds. So, the, the, you know, anytime that this can be shared with stakeholders, that's amazing, you know, and it should be. Um, stakeholders should not be in the dark about what their data is being used for, what the analysis process is. And so, Absolutely. I would just say it would take, you know, some time to be able to, especially with people who aren't familiar with evaluation or qualitative analysis, to be able to explain that. Um, and so it would probably have to be done visually. It would be done through, you know, explanations and things like that. But yeah, absolutely. Um, it should be, and I would highly encourage that. Awesome. I consolidated the majority of these questions. Some of them were, were multiples from different people. Um, let me see if there's anything that I missed. And yes, a lot of questions about the recording. The recording is going to be shared. Um, I can pop in here. This is Beverly um, Peters, the director of the Measurement and Evaluation Program. Um, the recording uh, is currently on LinkedIn uh, through Facebook Live. The program has a Facebook page, and so we live streamed it through the Facebook page. Um, so you can connect with me on LinkedIn, and I think you can get access to it that way. Uh, it will take us about a week to get the recording onto the university YouTube page. Um, I guess I could start my video. It'll take us about a week to get it onto the university YouTube page. Um, but for now, uh, I'm told that it's working on, on LinkedIn because I'm getting you know, comments on it on LinkedIn. So please just uh, connect with me. Uh, connecting with me means that you'll get access when we have public webinars again like this, you will get access to those registration details. 
Um, and uh, yeah, all the other fun stuff that uh, I like to post about. I don't know, I'll let you, I'll do a wrap up at the end, but Shelly, I'll let you continue to moderate here. Okay, well, I think we've covered. Are there any other questions that you wanna to add to the chat? We still have a, a few minutes, let me. Someone asked if you would include your descriptive codes and themes in your report that you share. Yes. Um, many times it would be in kind of uh, an annex or an appendix if it's just kind of like a list of codes or kind of just technical information. Um, but yes, I would definitely include that in kind of an appendix or an format. Excellent. And the document that was worked with um, uh, Dr. Peters, that's gonna be shared with attendees as well. Yeah, we can find a way to do that. Excellent. I'll probably put it in a Google doc <laughs> and um, share it that way if it's okay with you, Seth. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think we've covered a lot of these questions in some form. You mentioned that using a large number is, is possible. Yeah. 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 I think we're all set. Okay. Well, I want uh, to thank everybody for Is there anything else? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I saw another question come up. And yep. I see some other questions coming in now. The last few questions. Um, can analysis type use any coding type and coding method? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can mix and match. And so when we're looking at that template, um, you can use inductive coding. I mean, yeah, so you can mix and match depending on those different kind of uh, definitions. Yes, you can. And another one. The final question was about using these methods with realist evaluation. Very specific question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I would have to have a little bit more information about you know the specific circumstance. But again, this I will say um, this is a method and a process, so you can use it with any kind of evaluation that that, that you come across. Um, the sky's the limit. Just use yeah. Is your imagination. Well, thank you so much, Seth. I do want to say this was this was a wonderful opportunity as a student for myself. I was, you know, listening, paying attention, writing personally. I can't wait to use these methods myself. I really appreciate the walkthrough, the practical application. Um, that that was really helpful, and I think this is going to be an incredibly useful tool. The feedback that we're getting is is that a lot of people are saying thank you so much. So excited do this again. <laughs> no pressure. So um, thank you again. And I'll hand it over to you. Beth. Thanks very much. I, I want to thank my colleagues today. Shelly, I know she's a student, but she's also a colleague, right? So I want to thank you very much for hosting uh, to our associate director, Jessica Bancroft, for being here today and for Seth Tucker for walking us through and helping us to understand how it is that we can analyze qualitative data easily. I am, or, or more easily, should I say, um, you know, I am one that is uh, geared towards qualitative data collection and analysis. And I really appreciate everything that, that you did today, Seth, to help us become uh, better researchers, better data analysts, and uh, better evaluators. Awesome. Uh, we are part of American University, the Measurement and Evaluation Program. We um, have a master's and certificate programs in evaluation. You can ping me on LinkedIn if you have any questions about our offerings. You suggest, I would suggest that you uh, link in with me. I don't, it's not called friending, but whatever it is, link in with me on LinkedIn. Um, we have webinars about once every six weeks or so. Happy if, if you come on topics such as this. So, you know, link up with me and then you'll get access to those um, invitations as well. And like I said, send me a, an email or, or, you know, ping me on LinkedIn if you're interested in learning more about the program. Thanks everybody for joining us today. It was a fantastic day. Um, 
we're really happy that everyone was able to, to come in to listen and to ask questions and engage and learn. Thank you very much, Seth and team. Thank you. Thank you.